That song was definitely by the Holy Ghost, as usual. Because one of the things that the Lord is saying to us this morning, it's about being expectant. Amen? Let's bow our heads for a short word of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning. You are a great God, great Father, a friend, a helper, a intercessor, a standby, a comforter. You are everything to us, O oh God. And we bless your name. We thank you for your presence in this house. That you've been talking to us all morning. Through the prayers, through the songs, and the word, the school of the word, and the offerings. And just in every way. The love that you're showing one another. We thank you for your presence in this place. And we ask you even now. That you continue to have your way. That you speak through my mouth this morning. Do that which you desire to do in this house and in your people. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Exalted. I am so glad that you guys are fired up this morning. Amen. That's a good way to stay. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, uh, uh, Deacon, for that. Sometimes you're not sure why you're shouting. <laughs> but unconsciously you just have this at the back of your this thing disturbing you or whatever so thank thank the lord for that thank you amen praise the lord um this morning i am going to um continue a little bit where we, we stopped because one of the things i'd say that god said to me as part of our ruling and our reigning as kings is that we're gonna there's gonna be divine acceleration of visions and dreams. And he said to us that it's, it's, it's always his desire to move us quickly. Praise the Lord. Because he wants to accomplish his purpose in us. And so we said that the meaning of accelerate, you know, using a vehicle as an example, was his capacity to gain speed within a short period of time. So in other words, you increase the rate or speed of something you step it up, you advance, you increase, you surge, you escalate. Amen? Amen? And we saw that whenever there is a stalling or a slowing down or no manifestation, it usually signifies a loss of vision. And without vision, you really cannot make progress, proper progress. Amen? Amen. And so this morning, I'm just going to continue. And um, the title of my message, Divine Acceleration, part two, but... Subtitled, I will hasten my word to perform it. As I began to ask the Lord what to share this morning, that scripture actually had been in my heart ever since um, I shared with you the last time. It had just been in, just been in my heart, but I wasn't thinking you know, I was gonna, it was going to direct me to share on that. And so when um, I, dis I, I discovered I was supposed to share, and I asked the Lord, you know you always ask the Lord, right? You always ask the Lord. You see what happened to those people? They thought they were all that at the bag of chiefs because they won the first battle. And so now they went into another battle. They didn't ask the Lord, and they got defeated. So it's always, it's always good to, you know, be in that kind of connection with the Lord where you understand that he's the one who um, has established you. He's the one who has given you what you have. He's the one who's your Lord, who's sending you wherever you're going. And he's your ability, and he's your strength. No matter where you've been in life, what you've accomplished, you always want to put yourself in that place of humility. That's why we need to learn well in our School of the World classes. You know, we are learning about humility now, right? So we need to do that. So when I asked him, he said that, he said, I will hasten my word to perform it. I'm like, oh, okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So while we were, while we were talking about, um, we've been actually, even past, pastor included, going back again to the book of Habakkuk, and Luke chapter 4, I believe that those are very significant scriptures for us, even in this season. And so we see where Jesus was preaching to the people, and he said that he came to bring recovery of sight. And we saw that recovery of sight had to do with lost vision. So it wasn't just opening the eyes of the blind, literally like someone is blind, and then now they can see the things around them, but it's being able to see what God has called them to be, who God has called them to, to be, and where God is saying that they should go to. And so Jesus said that he came to bring recovery of sight, and he said that now is the accepted time. 
the time of Jubilee. Amen? And we know that Jubilee, in those days, when they talk about Jubilee, they ha it had to do with a period of time where there was a release. But at that time, for them to see and experience and enjoy this release, they had to wait for seven years, for 50 years, they had to wait. And that's why God is telling us, Jesus now began to tell the people that, I want to let you know that you don't have to wait any longer. And that's why I'm declaring to you that that's, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the season. This is the day. This is the time of the Lord's favor. This is your season of jubilee. This is your time of release. And so you no longer have to wait anymore. Right there in your bedroom, you can shout, release. You can tell the enemy where to go when he's trying to take stuff from you. Amen. You can, you can take back whatever or you can have whatever it is that God is saying that you should have. Amen. And so we also looked at Habakkuk, and the Bible talks about Habakkuk when he began to say that I will stand upon my watch, which why, this is why now in this time of fasting and prayer, it's good to take it really seriously because visions and dreams that will um, impact kingdom for us being kings and priests and rulers and want to rule and dominate, any kind of vision and dream, it should be by the Spirit. That means I want to make sure that our visions and our dreams are coming from the Spirit of God. Amen? Praise the Lord. So he said, I will stand upon my watch, and I will, I will, I will wait to see what he will say to me. And that's the reason why when we go to the place of prayer, we're not just saying, telling God what we want. We're not just telling God what to do, right? But we're, as we're there in the place of prayer, prayer is about communication. It's like back and forth. We listen and God speaks and we speak and that's how prayer is supposed to be. And so one of the major things that we actually ought to be doing in the place of prayer is listening for what he will say. And then one of the things that God said to the prophet, he said, he said write the vision down. He said, make it plain. Make it so plain. Make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. That means that even a runner can read it as it's passing by. That's so that the, the message can be taken quickly. Make it so plain. Make it plain. And God said that we should put it down for clarity. And when there is clarity, you are able to maintain speed and increase speed. You are able to accelerate. That's one of the reasons why he said that you should make it plain. You're able to move quickly because the vision is clear. You don't need to spend any kind of time waiting and trying to figure out what am I supposed to do now? What am I, you know, what, what now? After God has already given you the vision, amen, or maybe you haven't yet received one, you need to get one so that your life will begin to fall into the places, the part that God will have you to fall. And so, for clarity, we need to write the vision down. That's what he said to them. And one of the things that is good to have your vision really clear is that you are able to shun any kind of divisiveness, any kind of anything comes your way that is trying to give you a division, double vision, make you double-minded about what you're doing at that time. You immediately spot it. You say, I wrote this down. This is not one of the things I wrote. Keep moving. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you, you, don't, you don't get sidetracked just any old kind of way. You don't get moved. You are stable, you are secure because there is clarity of vision. You know exactly where you're going. Now, you may not have all of the details, but you do know that this is where God is saying, and you stick with it, and as you go, he lets you know it. So he said, write the vision down. How many of us have written some things down this period? Praise the Lord, that's good. And you know, sometimes when you begin to talk about divine acceleration, there are certain things that people begin to think about. Okay, what about faith and patience? Well, patience does not mean you should be slow. Patience has to do with the ability to stick to what you believe. Here again, vision. So that just like, for example, blind Bartimaeus, he wanted to see, he wanted to see, and he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And guess what? They wanted to stop him, but he kept on. That's patience. He shouted all the more. That's patience. So it's not about being slow. It's about sticking with what you believe until there is a manifestation. Amen? Amen? And so, let's turn to my main text this morning. Jeremiah, chapter 1, media, thank you so much for your um, help this morning. And if you can put Jeremiah up there for me. I would like to read from verse um, 10. So, because in this time of um, um, ruling and reigning, 
we need to know that divine acceleration is part of the things that is, um, is, is, is characteristics of, of kingdom people. Whoever saw a, a king, you know, for example, a king is coming to visit, you prepare ahead of time. You don't wait until he arrives before you start making preparations. So things move quickly when the king is around. The king has the power and the ability to cause things to move quickly. So where people are lazing around and just doing any old kind of thing, and they say, hey, the king is coming now, everybody moves. And so that's why God is saying that we need to realize and understand that part of our calling is to be able to move quickly. Amen? For the work of ministry, for the manifestation of the things that he's calling us to do. So in the King James Version here in Jeremiah um, chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, See, I have set thee over nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And he said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Tell somebody, say, He, he. Hastens, his word hastens his word to perform it. Now, I'm going to read from two other translations this morning, which I think will also bring a little, a little more clarity to what I'm saying. But I'll just um, read it here. It says, See, I have said this uh, from the New King James Version, says it like this. It says, I've said this day before you over the nations. I've said this day. I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. This immediately tells us, right, when you read the scripture, you know that as kings, people shouldn't be pushing you around. Circumstance and situation should not be pushing you around. You shouldn't be feeling downcast and let down and all bad, praise the Lord, because God has set you to throw things down and not things to throw you down. So anything that comes to stand against you, against the word that God has called you to do, it is within your rights and your authority and your ability to cast them down. And so God is saying to build and to plant. So of course, the only things that we are supposed to do is not throw things down. But we are also supposed to build and we are supposed to plant. We are supposed to make things grow and flourish and bloom. And we're supposed to cause people to see the glory of God on the earth. Amen. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. I am ready. Tell somebody sitting beside you, say, God is ready. God is, ready. God is not getting ready. <laughs> he is ready to perform his word. And I'll read from the message translation. And in the message translation, God reached out, touched my mouth, and said, Look, I have just put my words in your mouth, hand delivered. See what I've done? I've given you a job to do among nations and governments. A red letter day. Your job is to pull up and tear down, take apart and demolish, and then start over building and planting. So in other words, anything that is not of God, our job is to get rid of that stuff. And then replace it with the right stuff. Because just like the, the, uh, God, God brought us out to take us into something. So he didn't just deliver us on the power of darkness. Guess what? He brought us into the kingdom of light. And so that's what the same calling that God has given to us. To stop things that are not right. Things that are not going right. Things that are not the way that they should be. And that's why he began to tell us that, hey, get ready. You just might be the one to go into the governments. And to pull some things down so that we can build properly. Amen. And he said, God's message came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I said, a walking stick. That's all. And God said, good eyes. I'm sticking with you. I'll make every word I give you come true. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so God is saying, I am sticking with you. Now, when God sticks with you, when God sticks with you, nothing can stop that which he says that you can have. But the issue now is not about God sticking with us. The issue is about are we sticking with God? And God is calling us to stick with him through the process. Stick with him. So that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation is, he says, stick with me. I'm sticking with you. He says, I watch over my word to perform it. So when God is watching over something to make sure that it happens, you can be sure that it's done. 
you can be sure it will get done because when, when anybody that is in authority comes back and there's so many excuses going on around, the one in authority has the ability to move things around and make that, those obstacles go away. Hallelujah. And God is saying, I'm sticking with you. And we need to be constantly aware that the Lord and Master is with us. He's on our side. He's not against us. And that's the reason why the enemy is fighting so hard to make us believe that God is against us. And that God is not with us. And that God is looking at us as if we're not good enough. How can he say we're not good enough when he went to the cross and died for us? That was an awesome price that he paid for you and I. That, That shows us how much he values us. He said, nothing else that man could create with your hands is what you. So I'm giving my very blood. Amen. And so that's one thing that we, mo- we, we must always remember, how valuable we are to God. Amen. How much he placed, how much with a price that he paid for us. Amen? Amen. And so we cannot uh, uh, leave Jeremiah 1 there, where we just read, without talking about certain significance of the almond tree, because it is significant. One thing about the almond tree, which I believe is why God gave me that verse of scripture, is that the almond tree is one tree, fruit tree, that bears fruit very quickly. It takes three months or 120 days for it to go from flower stage to fruit bearing stage. And it is one of the first trees, the first fruit that bears fruit in the year actually in late January, about January, and by March, its fruit is manifesting. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are already getting the revelation of some stuff. Glory, Glory to God. Now, you, there, are, there are also some other kind of trees. Why it's important to understand that God wants things to move really quickly. There are also some other kinds of things that take a very long time to, to, to blossom. And it's just one of the things that came to my heart that I just thought I would throw in there. One of the, the trees, um, the, the trees or the plants or whatever that takes a while to, to bloom is the, is the kola nut tree. It takes years to, 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 to bloom. And at the end of the day, its fruit is bitter. <laughs> and as I was studying, I said to myself, I said, wow. You see, one of the things about people's visions and dreams being prolonged is that at the end of the day, they become bitter. When, when things that you're expecting to manifest and all of that is not happening, it can cause people to go sour. It can cause them to, to get down and actually be bitter towards God and towards other people. But God is saying that it is not me who is causing things to be slow. It is not me who is wanting things to be delayed. It is not me because he doesn't want us to be bitter. He, want, he wants to accelerate that which he has given to us, that which he has put on the inside of us. And so he used this tree, the vision that he gave um, um, Jeremiah, the almond tree, because it blooms very quickly. And he said, I will hasten my words to perform it. He said, I will watch over my word to perform it. And when God watches over his word, when God is doing things in your life, you better believe that it's high performance. Hallelujah. It is high high performance. So God is saying, I will almond tree it. Speed it up. Make it ready for due season in a short time. Time. In a short time. Hallelujah. Now, I just want to say that this, I believe, is a prophetic utterance for us as a church. Get ready. Now, we're not very big on this, but one of the things that the Bible says, it says, in the time of the latter rain, ask God for rain. I think it's Zechariah 10, 1 that says that. So that means that when there is an anointing for something, when there is a grace, when something is being spoken for as God's word, release your faith for it. And I believe that the reason why God is, is bringing this back again is because some of us have not taken the message seriously that God wants to accelerate. But I believe that in the next three months, that's how strongly I believe in the things that God is going to do for you and I. That those that are expecting that between now and the month of March, position yourself, there's something significant is going to take place for us. I don't know about you. I've released my faith, and I'm believing it, and I'm believing God. Change of status is taking place. And some of you have already begun to experience it. Now, if you, leave, if you listen and pay attention very quick, you know, uh, if you pay attention in the spirit, there is a kind of excitement about this year. Key into that. Don't expect business as usual. Because it's what you expect that that you will see. And so God is saying to us, I believe, very specifically, that we need to watch out for significant upgrades. 
that has already started spiritually, health-wise, financially, accomplishments of certain visions and dreams. Do you believe this? I believe it. Hallelujah. And in this year, we are getting rid of all those myths that say, uh, it's not my time, you know, the right time, you know, there's time for everything. Watch out. Do not put all of that in your mouth. That is not what God is talking about in this season. In this season, he said, I will hasten my word. I am ready to bring my word to pass. He's talking about some acceleration of visions and dreams that have taken a long time. Hallelujah. And when kings show up, things move faster. Keep that in the back of your mind when you're talking about ruling and reigning. And that's why when the Spirit of God begins to speak to you, get up and move. Gone are the days of being lazy. All of our scriptures, God does not like the slothful man. Doesn't like the lazy man. And God is giving us visions, dreams, ideas, witty inventions. Begin to take opportunities. Do whatever needs to, you need to do to take opportunities. Because if God shows you something, it means that he has made the provision somewhere. Find it. The Bible says it's for kings to search out a matter. He, it's not about kingship just saying, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. Get up and rule and reign. And it's going to take you being diligent. And you being stepping out. And you being bold enough not to be afraid to try new things. That's what God is saying to us. Forget about all that meat of, of myth of, 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 oh, maybe it's not time. It's just one another man's lazy man excuse. But you are not lazy. Amen. You are kings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, when, 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 when God began to talk to Habakkuk in chapter 2, he said, he said, it is for an appointed time. And people get stuck in there. And that's why the Bible says that Paul began to pray that the eyes of their understanding shall be enlightened. Yeah. He says, open their eyes so that they will see. He said, the vision is yet for an appointed time. He says, though we tarry, wait for it, it will not tarry. Now, the vision and the appointed time that God was talking about, that they need to wait for, at least one of the things he was saying in there, was the appointed time of the coming of Christ. Please turn to Galatians 4.4 4 for me. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 4, if you can just put it up there. And Jesus, Jesus in Luke 4, he came and he fulfilled it. He fulfilled it. He says, but the Bible says in Galatians 4, 4, he says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so maybe you have been waiting or you think, oh, appointed time, you're, you're, you got, you've gotten caught up or in a rut, not you, some people, praise the Lord, of, oh, no, not the appointed time. The Bible says the fullness of time has come. And Christ has come. And that's one of the reasons why in Luke chapter 4, Jesus began to say, I've come to declare to you that the time of the Lord's favor is now. Amen. Don't let anybody deceive you. That you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to wait, you know, it's tiring, but I'm just, no, 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 now, now, now. hallelujah. Yeah. Let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4. Hmm. Now, every day is due season. I, I, can't, I, can't, <laughs> I can't wait for my, compu my computer to load up over here. Every day is due season for us as the believer. The Bible says in from verse 1, it says, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter rest, as he said, as we have, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter my rest, seeing therefore it remained that some must enter therein, and they will, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day. Look at this. He limited a certain day. God has placed limits 
<laughs> oh, I don't know how to explain this to you. He limited a certain day. Saying to David, today. today. <laughs> Hallelujah. He has limited everything to today. Amen. It's no longer for 50 years. Amen. It's no longer for seven years. A hundred years. He limited it to today. Amen. He limited it to today. I don't know what you're believing God for. Today you can receive it. We are the ones who are adding days and years and all of that that he has not added. The Bible says that he limited to a certain day after so long a time. As it is said, today, again, look at it, today, if you will hear his voice, he said, harden not your heart. And that's what is going on, his hardness of heart. His refusal to believe, his wrong teaching, his tradition, it's all of those things. Those things enter into a man and cause him to be hardened. And then the manifestation is prolonged, if it even comes at all, because of hardness of heart. But he says that if you will believe, if you hear his voice today, he said, don't harden your heart. He says, enter into it. He said, receive it, believe it. Don't be believing so much what the doctor is saying. Don't be believing what your bank accounts are saying. Don't be believing what the enemy is whispering in your ears about your marriage relationships, your children, and all of those kinds of things. You need to get up and declare what God says. I begin to declare, today there is change in my house. And then when you declare it, begin to act like it. Because God, he lives in the eternal now. He is always now. So when you pray for something, begin to act as if it has already manifested. Amen. And the problem that is happening many times is that when people pray, they are still expecting that it will happen. But because God is not within time, God lives outside of time. God, we enter into eternity when we believe God. We step out of time. And that's what God is saying, that when you can step out of time, you can declare and you can believe and you can begin to enjoy the fruit of things that you may not even have seen yet, but it's already manifesting. And as you stay there and you keep your confession, then you will see the manifestation and God will be glorified. God has limited a certain day and he has called it today. Today. Don't wait for... Oh, it's tomorrow. It's next year. Oh, maybe no. It's today. And that's the same reason why God, when God presents opportunities to you, get up and go today. Now, leave the food you are eating. Leave the TV you are watching. Get up and move. You have to begin. Listen, you have to begin to train yourself like that. Be ready when God speaks because many times that's what, what makes the difference. Time is pregnant with opportunities. And we have got to take those opportunities. Because opportunities, they just present themselves. They are not delayed. They are not like waiting, oh, let me wait for them. Opportunities present themselves. You take it now. God has limited a certain day. It's today. It's a great opportunity to take. To believe God today. Amen? Amen. Let's jump to verse 12. Let's jump to verse 12 because of time. Let's read what verse 12 is saying. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Bible says that the word of God is quick. Jesus is the word. He lives on the inside of you. And when you have the word of God with you, it causes things to move quickly. It is powerful. It can pierce through everything that tries to stop you, that stands in your way. You have the word of God to cause that change so that you can move quickly. Amen. It's quick. It's powerful. The Bible says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Hallelujah. I like, I like this life. Yes. I like this life. Glory. Move to ver uh, verse 16, please. It's all good. You can go back and read it, but I just want us to look at it. It says, let us therefore... Come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. It's good for us to know that God wants us to have this thing so that we can come boldly before his throne of grace. To know that God wants you to have it right now. He wants you to have it more than you even want it. He wants you to advance and increase and prosper and manifest. He wants you healed, delivered, set free. Today, the Bible says that today is a day of salvation. 
It's all over scriptures that God is calling us to acceleration. Today, he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen now. And when he says that today is the day of salvation, we all know that salvation is not just us being, you know, born again, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It doesn't end there. With, with being born again, your healing, your deliverance, everything, he says now. Now. That's what the, he's saying. Now. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, you can be healed now. There can be an increase in your investment now. You can get pregnant now. Anything that it is that you want, you can have it now. That's what God is saying. He says, but who will believe? Who has believed our report? To whom has, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord talks about the salvation of God. His might, his ability, his power, the investment that he, 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 put, he made for us on our behalf. So who has it been revealed? Them that would look at him, look at the word, and believe, and receive. You and I, God has great things for us. And he has gone to all of the lengths that is needed. Jesus healed in today. Amen. Jesus never told anybody, come back tomorrow for your healing. He healed in today. If he healed in today, 2,000 years ago, he's still healing in today now. Don't let the, your mind or anybody or anything tell you any, any better, tell you any, any otherwise, any different. He heals in today. God has limited a certain day, and that day is today, now. I believe it. How about you? I believe it. And I'm not, I'm not limiting God anymore. I'm rather limiting everything that I need to today. <laughs> I rather limit other things and limit my God. He's a good God. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus healed him today. And I want us to read from Amos chapter 9, verse 13, if you can put it up there for me. Thank you. Hallelujah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that a plowman will overtake the reaper. And the treader of grace, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. So the Bible is telling us that, uh, it says, and then it talks about all these other things. Now bring the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build away cities and inhabit them, and all of that. Go and read it some more. Amen. And we also know that he's also talking about all of the things that he wants. So Amos 9.13 is a prophetic time adjustment. God is saying to us, God is showing them, it's one of the many places again. You know, the Bible says that out of two, the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? And so it's not just, oh, uh, it's a year of acceleration just by mouth because it sounds good. This is what God is saying and it's all over the scriptures. And we need to believe God to enter into it. So it's a prophecy of time adjustment. He's saying that a time is coming that the, that the what? We overtake the reaper. Or the sower will overtake the reaper. Amen. And so he's saying that he's compressing time. It doesn't mean that he is going to skip steps. And somebody say, hey, I don't have to do any work. Just harvest, harvest. <laughs> it, all it means is that you're going to be able to do more in a short amount of time. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's not about skipping steps or being lazy. Tell the person beside you. You still have to do some work. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, in the natural, you have, there's a, there are some laws that are followed, like sowing. You sow the seeds, you plow, you water. What else? You sow, you plow, you water, you weed, and all of that, and then it's time to, re to harvest. So now, in between all of these things, you find time. You find the sowing, you have time, you, find, you have the plowing, you have, and then you have the former rain. The Bible talks about the former rain, the latter rain. You know, I know some of us are not farmers, but praise the Lord. Yeah, different kinds of rains, and if farmers that are here would understand this a, a lot, but you by the Spirit can key into some of these things, amen? And so there's time for the rains and all of those to come and to, to, to help the, the seed grow. And many times, this in the natural, I think it happens about two, twice in a year. 
But God is saying that this is going to be more than, it's not just going to be like the natural. It's not just going to be like the natural. You are going to be able to sow, reap, 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 sow, reap. Before you finish sowing, you are going to reap. Before you finish reaping, you are going to sow, sow, reap. That's the way it's going to look. It's going to look as if you're just sow, reap, sow, reap. As if all those things in between are not there. That's what God is saying. That's what God is saying. Time is being adjusted and we're going to be able to accomplish more in a short amount of time. Change of levels in a short amount of time. Praise the Lord. Be able to plant more times and reap more times because time is being accelerated. Hallelujah. And so we don't have to wait long. Maybe before you used to be the kind of person who used to cry over everything. And when you're upset, you stay upset for three months before you get back to normal. You are delivered today in Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> So, all of that whining is going to be cut short quickly. You're going to be healed from it quickly. You will no longer wait for three months to get over it. You will not wait for three months to forgive your husband or your wife or your children. Forgiveness is going to be very quickly. All of that is going to happen really quickly. That's what the Spirit of God is saying. It is time for us to move quickly. We don't have time crying and griping and complaining and holding on forgiveness and feeling sad and feeling bad when we have been empowered. We are kings. Amen. We are kings. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we are moving. Yeah. We are moving. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And God will exceed your expectations. Amen. I don't know what you have been expecting. But the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20 that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask, think, or imagine, according. Hear that now, according to the power that is at work in you. And that's why you can't afford to sleep and sleep and sleep. You have to get up and charge up yourself, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost, he charges you up. He builds you up. He strengthens you. He encourages you. He reminds you about who you are. He reminds you about what God's word says. So when you are going through tough times, he's whispering in your ear, you can do this. You don't have to react like that. You don't have to respond like that. I know you did that. Okay, turn around quickly. Repent. Change your mind. Move around so that you can be accelerated. Remember, acceleration is about changing direction. And you have to be ready when God says change direction to change direction. Because if you don't change direction, you will not be able to accelerate. Amen. Tell the person beside you, God is doing exceedingly. Abundantly. Above all we can ask. Or think or even imagine. Let's, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, um, very, um, I know sometimes we may miss it, but we probably even already talked about it. But there's so much that is in there. And we see that the, the believers had gotten filled with the Holy Ghost in the previous chapters. And after they got filled with the Holy Ghost, things began to move very quickly. Right? right. Began to preach. Many people began to be added to the church. Miracles began to take place, and this is one of such miracles. You know, you see, I just, let me just interject this here. When the people got filled with the Holy Ghost, one of the things that the Holy Ghost did for them, I believe, was give them clarity of vision. And because their vision was clear and focused, they did not, they did not um, lose a beat or miss a beat when people began to mock them and say, these men are drunk. Instead of being ashamed, and saying, hey, all this language, we are saying. The Bible says that they thought they were drunk. Now, when somebody, we are talking and somebody is saying you are drunk, they are mocking you. But they did not allow the mockery to stop them. Instead, they began to preach the gospel. They stayed focused and they preached. They did what they were filled with the Holy Ghost to do. And one of the reasons why you find that even today, people don't want to preach the gospel because of shame. They allow people to sidetrack them, and that's when you immediately know that your vision is not clear. When your vision is clear, it doesn't matter what anybody says to you. It doesn't matter what is going on around you. You stay focused. If one person shuts the door on you, you go to the next door and you knock. And that is how there will be acceleration. 
There will be kingdom expansion in the church. When everybody is standing up and not paying attention to what everybody is saying about you not good enough to preach or you, why are you disturbing me? They're not ashamed, those kind of things. When you stay focused on the vision, it will cause multiplication like we saw even in the, in the book of Acts. Now, when they went to the temple, I read from verse 2, okay, from verse 1. Now, now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask arms of them that entered into the kingdom. Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an arms? Hallelujah. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Now, I want to say something about this. Is it not interesting? How is it that a lame man is asking them for money and he wasn't looking at them? When you are asking for something, aren't you supposed to be looking at the person that you're asking the thing of. Yeah. The man has been lame from birth, crippled all his life. So as obviously at least from the time where he was mature enough to be on his own, his parents probably sent him out and said, you go, take care of yourself. And so he must have been begging for most of his life. Now when you've been doing something for a long time, for a long time, for a long time, <laughs> after a while, you can lose your enthusiasm. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says you take heed, pay earnest heed and attention to that which you have learned, lest it slips away from you. And the slipping away from you is not just like, oh, today you're born again, tomorrow you're not, no. It just goes quietly away. And before you know it, you're not acting the way you should, saying well, how to be talking how you should be talking. You're just, it's like there's no excitement, no enthusiasm. There's not, it's slipping away from you. Where there used to be excitement and joy and, and, and expectation and all of that, it's no longer there. And so he had to say, look on us. Because maybe this guy has been begging for such a long time. And when he first started, he was like, hey, hey, somebody, give me some money. Can't you see that I'm lame? I need money. Hey, hey, everybody passing by. But after a while, Sometimes he receives little, sometimes he receives nothing. How many of us know that it's not every time that somebody shouts that people give them stuff? Yes. So after a while, he says, ma'am, sir, money, can you give me something? He's no longer, hey, somebody, give me money. Then after a while, he's in another thing, he's like, give me money, though. Give me money now, give me, give me. He's doing other things. He's not paying as much as attention, even though that's where he's getting his livelihood from. But he's been doing this for so long. Remember the Elijah woman we talked about, Elisha and the Shunammite woman? She, knew, she didn't have a child. Been married a long time. Obviously been praying. She didn't have the child. And then the man of God came to her and said to her, what do you need? She said, I live among my people. I'm good. I'm in the church. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm good. This healing thing, this miracle thing, I'm, uh, at least I'm born again. I'm saved. I know that we we'll look at her and say, uh -uh, tell the man of God now. She had lost her expectation. She had lost her enthusiasm. She had been praying for a long time or believing for a long time. And at a point, she just gave up. And she stopped expecting. So that even when she was asked, asked directly, so past prayer experiences, maybe it got you little or nothing. So now, even when you go to pray, you really don't expect. And that's dangerous. Because if you go to God and you don't expect, you will not get. But that's the thing that the enemy has done. He tries to frustrate. And that's the reason why we have to take the word. And we have to have a relationship with God to help us understand how are we supposed to be praying about this. What are we supposed to be doing about this? It's not just about seven steps. Because sometimes people want to do seven steps and they lack understanding. The Bible says with all you're getting, get wisdom. He said get wisdom with all you're getting, get understanding. 
And so you don't just do things out of sense knowledge. Self-righteousness and all of those kinds of things are the things that cause people not to receive or not to get their prayers heard. The Bible says that Jesus said, he said, don't think that your prayers will be heard for your much speaking. So you think you are shouting loud and you are speaking, it will not be heard because of that. It will be heard because of the, the, the quality of the word. What you are saying, is it legal? Is it in the word? Do you, are you thinking it's self-righteousness? You, you know, he said, it's not by your much speaking. In other words, it is going to be by grace and faith. Believe, receive. Amen. It's not about shouting and thinking in your mind, in the back of your mind. It's like if I shout long, long enough. If I, if I cry, <laughs> praise the Lord. If I do this, if I do that, find out what it is. Because after a while, expectation begins to be lowered, and that's the devil's master plan. And so look here, and you find that, that that's the place where we're reading. He says that, until the Holy Ghost filled people came to this guy. They forced his attention. Let's read it. It says, and seeing Peter and... Uh, okay, where did we stop? He says, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Now, when he began to expect, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and work. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And the Bible says that he leaping up and he leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And the Bible says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. All because he changed his expectation. Now we need to pay attention to what God is saying to us about our expectations. They said, look on us. So in other words, how dare you ask God for something and not expect? How dare you come to God in prayer and not expect? He said, look on us. And there are some times that God has placed people in your life, anointed people at certain times. Look on us. They are giving you the word. He said, look on us. Listen to what we have. It's not going to be about business or usual. You might see that, you know, other things are happening and, you know, you hear all kinds of things about pastors, about this, about that. That's not what you're supposed to be paying attention for. At. Look on us. Amen. Look at the anointed people that God has placed in your life and recognize them and look on us. But there is something that is deeper in here. There is something in case you missed it. It was not personalities. And I believe that the Holy Ghost was speaking through Peter when he said, look on us. The Holy Ghost was saying, look on us. Look on us. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost lives on the inside. Look on us. And that's why God is saying to you and I today, look on us. Amen. You are in church, but look on us. Amen. Look on us. Jesus is on the inside of you. He paid the price. Look on us. The Holy Ghost is on the inside of you. Look on us. Expect that that wish that you carry on the inside of you will bring that thing to manifestation and fruition. Look on us. Amen. Look at Sarah. She laughed. The Shunammite woman said, don't lie to me. And all of these people that were like, they've given up hope. So maybe that's you. God is saying, look on us. There is power on the inside of you. But you have got to take your attention from your past experiences, from the naysayers, from the sight. Because the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And you cannot walk by faith when you are looking at anything else but Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Look on us. Now Jubilee has come. You've been delivered. You've been set free. Look on us. If you are going to see a miracle, look on us. And that's going to mean that you're going to keep gazing and you're going to keep looking. And it doesn't matter how long, but you keep your eyes and you keep looking. And he's calling out. He says, look on us. There's so many times that people are going to all kinds of places and psychiatrists and doctors and lawyers and all of these things and financiers and all of that. And they're looking for help in every which way, kind of way. Look on us. The Holy Ghost is saying to us who believe. He said, look on us. Put your hope in God. He said, why so downcast to my soul? He said, put your hope in God. There is something on the inside of you 
you. The Bible says we carry this treasure in earthen vessels. You might look like you're just an ordinary man, but you're not an ordinary man. And this year, God is saying that when I'm calling you, kings, that it's time for you to rule and to reign, you had better look on us. Because you're ruling, the Bible says it's by me that kings reign. You have got to look on Jesus. Saying, look on us. Keep your expectation up. Don't go to prayer not expecting. Look on us. No longer self-sense knowledge or self-righteousness, thinking that it's going to get you the result. No, you will stay there for a very long time. You have got to look on us. Maybe you've been praying faithless prayers. Depend on your own ability. Because sometimes, even though people say they are believing in God, but they are believing in their own ability. You can deceive yourself. And you have got to check. That's why the Bible says, examine yourself if ye be in faith. Are you depending on God? Recently, I had to make some changes with some certain things. I, every time I, 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 I notice that, look, you're beginning to try to get into sense, I turn around quickly. And I'm getting very quick results. We have got to make major adjustments in this area. If God is going to be able to accelerate the expansion of his kingdom through you and I. We're going to have to keep our eyes on, on Jesus. And we can think about, about Peter when, when the Bible says that he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. Now if there's a lot of sinking going on, it means that they are not looking. So people may cause God all they want, complain all they want, criticize and say, what are you talking about? The fault is in the one who is not able to receive from God, not God. He's perfect. But God is not here wanting to find fault. He's always opening his arms. And one of the instructions and directions that he's given to us today, he said, look on us. Amen. Keep your eyes on us. Amen. Because when you keep your eyes on him, you will get the manifestation. So this is a good time to examine your expectation. Have you lowered your expectation? Because maybe you've prayed and you didn't see some stuff. You no longer has fired up. But don't you, under, don't you see that it doesn't make any sense for you to come to your kitchen and you are boiling some, you're trying to cook some meat and you see that the, the, by now the fire should have come to a boil. The meat should be cooked by now. But it's not and then you turn down the flames. You turn up the heat. You turn up the heat and bring that thing to a boil. And that's what the Holy Ghost is on the inside of us. That's why the, the Bible says that he charges us up on the inside. He brings things to a boil so that there will be a manifestation. You don't turn down the heat. You turn it up. You turn it up. Why is this not working? You're supposed to be surprised and shocked when you pray and you don't see the manifestation. And you're supposed to, 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 to make it your aim, your goal, your whatever to make sure. That's what kings do. That that thing comes to pass. That you subdue it, you dominate it, you rule it. You make it happen. That's about kingship. You turn up the heat. You don't turn it down. What happens when people turn down their expectations? It's like they're trying to guard themselves. So when they, don't, when they pray and it doesn't really happen, they're not really surprised or disappointed. Okay, for lack of a better word. Not too disappointed, you know. They're used to that. I pray it doesn't happen well. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it don't, you know. And every time you pray for something according to the word of God, you should be expecting. And there will be a manifestation. Because the Bible says... We read Mark 11 a lot. What things soever ye desire... What things soever you desire. It's not even just talking about just your wants now. Oh, your needs now. Even the things that you desire, the good things. He said, I give you all things freely to enjoy. How much more thinking that lowering your expectation when it comes to your healing. When it comes to your financial stability. You do not lower your expectation. You turn up the heat. Why is this thing not working? And you make it work. Turn up the heat. Tell the person beside you, say, turn up the heat. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes people are frustrated and take it out on their husbands. 
and their wives. And they take it out on everybody else. And they get mad at God. Turn up the heat. By the Holy Ghost, go into your closet and pray and believe God until you get revelation. Amen. What is going on here? Even if it is important enough, even if it takes you a year, in the closet. Because some of you may need a year. <laughs> to get rid of some stuff. It doesn't have to. Because remember that we said that God lives outside of time. But all he's requiring is look on us. Keep your eyes on him. And many times he's staying in the closet. It's not just like you're trying to make God do something. It's to, to train yourself to take your eyes off power and might. Self-righteousness. My own ability. The way I used to think. Traditions. What I have been taught. Is to take your eyes and your mind. The strongholds that have been built up. To get in the word until... Your eyes are open to begin to see, yes, Lord, you are the healer. Wow, you are my provider. Wow, you did this for me before the foundation of the world. All I have to do is to step into it. Wow, until your eyes become open, you turn up the heat. Amen. <sighs> Hallelujah. So this time of prayer is a good time to examine how you have been expecting. Are you expecting to receive any time you pray? The goals, the projects, or even if you wrote $10 million on your, on your goal. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say, you know what, you better just put, a, a, what do you call it now? Uh, achievable goals. Let me tell you something. Let's leave that. <laughs> but you better know that whatever your desire is, as long as it's one billion, faith can get it. Now, when I said that, some people were just like, e, I was only thinking about 100,000 before. <laughs> <laughs> Change your mind. That means you're, look on us. Hallelujah. American dollar don't work in, in, in uh, heaven. No, 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 no. God has all you need. You think you hear trillions. You hear them talking about trillions and then you are thinking, change your mind Amen. let the Holy Ghost stir you up on the inside and rekindle your expectation Amen, Amen. Hallelujah I'm just thinking go to please put up Luke chapter 18 for me verse 39 Luke chapter 18 from verse 39 have you heard the, the, the thing that says, um, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen? Yeah. All right. So if I were you, and that's what me, I'm doing too, I'm turning up the heat so that the devil can get out of my kitchen. Yeah. Because I have some cooked stuff cooking. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, one of the signs of, of, of lack of expectation is that... Um, you don't really praise God properly. Your praise is not true. And sometimes as a pastor, it grieves my heart. Thank God this year we have changed and everything. It grieves my heart when I can sense that people pray, are praising God mechanically. It's mechanic. You come to church because it's Sunday. So Sunday, let's go to church. No expectation. But we have, all have to be in expectation. A person who is in expectation praises God with zeal and fervor. Because the Bible says this is the day, not because it's Sunday, but this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So a person who truly expecting something praises God well, fervently, happily, joyfully, not mechanically. Not because somebody say praise God now, praise God. When you lack expectation, your spiritual life is on autopilot. Some people don't know, but their spiritual life is on autopilot. They know exactly what to do, when to do, go to church, go here, you praise, and everything, but it's on autopilot. It's just going through the motions. Autopilot. No expectation. 
yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, this is what we do. Okay, yeah, and then go home. Okay. Are you expecting some benefits today? Yes. The Bible says that he daily loads us with benefit. So that means that our lives, when we wake up, when we are doing anything, we expect. Sometimes I say, Lord, what are my benefits for today? Yes. But you see, I'm also positioned also like, Lord, what would you have me do? Now, if I can come and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Why can I not say, Lord, what are my benefits? What can I believe you for today? I know he has made everything, but there's some stuff. Do I want some cupcakes? Okay. Maybe you don't like cupcakes. Do I want some, a pair of new shoes? Lord, thank you for my shoes. Thank you for my house. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Whatever it is, you thank God and you expect. And when I was, I was just, I was on this, I have been, in short, I have been declaring, I said, Lord, thank you for my new car. Thank you for my new house. That because I discovered that it is self-righteousness and it is, it is not understanding who God is for us to just settle for less. God wants us to have more. Do you know that unbelievers look at prosperity? That's one of the ways that you shine. Not just because you want to be, not, not, we're not talking about covetousness. Kings, as a king, there are certain things that are supposed to be yours. Ask God for it. Ask God for it and believe God. Maybe he's not saying go and mass your credit card. You know, one of the things that Miles Monroe says, he says that poor people spend money, rich people make money. So if all your mind and your life and everything is about how you can spend the money, you are not putting in place the way to make more money, you have a poverty mindset. And that's one of the problems many times that people don't increase. Yes, they are confessing and all of those kinds of things, but guess what? What are you putting in place to make some money? That was just Jara. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and so you come to church expecting, lift up your eyes. Don't put it down. And God is saying, I'm accelerating. So that means that if you were looking down before because you have lost your vision or your expectation, he says, look up now. Look on, up, on us. Fix your eyes on me. Changing direction. And when you look at him, acceleration. Acceleration. The speed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. The Holy Ghost on the inside of us. He reminds us that God is not slack. And I'm getting ready to round up. God is not slack concerning his promises. If you, if you are not expecting from God... It means that you are saying that God is slack. God is not slack concerning his promises. That's what the Bible says. He's not loose. He's not loose with his words. He doesn't just say something. And that's why people think God is slack because they are losing their own words. They say, I'm going to do something, but they don't really intend to. Just want to get you off their back. Say, oh, okay, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to buy this for you. That's why we always say that even here, we don't promise our children anything we don't intend to deliver. That's a rule in my house. We never, we rather say no than lie to you because that's lying. Oh, I'll buy you candy, but you have no intention. If you say you're going to buy the candy, you better get up and go buy the candy because you think that you are deceiving the child, getting them off your back. You are doing more harm than dummy, than, than, you are doing more harm than good and it's yourself you're affecting. Yes, the child will be affected because now you're teaching your child not to trust God when mama and daddy can't keep their word, how do you expect that I'll believe that God can keep his? And at the same time, you yourself are sowing seeds that you don't even want to reap. Any kind of deception is, is inviting the devil into your arena. And so we have to know that God is not slack. He's tight. You can take it to the bank. You can take it to the bank and cash in on it. If he said it, he will do it. And then finally, I want us to read some of the scriptures.
God always makes sure that he gets things to those who are expecting. So put up uh, Jeremiah. I'm just going to round up with these three scriptures. We'll read again from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 from verse 10. Read it to 12. The Bible says that, See, I have set this day over the nations. See, I have set... See, I have this day <laughs> set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then, then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Please put up Ezekiel chapter 12 verse 28 for me. Hallelujah. Are you guys expecting? Do yes. you still remember between our match? Yes. Glory to God. <laughs> Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged anymore, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 12, verse, from verse 22 to 23. Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the, ha in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus said the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. Amen. But say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. Praise the Lord. And thus says the Spirit of God to us. Hallelujah.